Well, you'd like you to open your Bibles, please, at Psalm 132, so that we can look through this uh, song from God's Word together. But I want to begin by telling you some really good news, really relevant to you all. Are you ready? Four months tomorrow is Christmas Day. <laughs> and the schools will have had their nativity plays and children would have dressed up as, you know, three wise men, shepherds, sheep, donkeys, whatever. And they will enact again the bare bones of the Christmas story. I don't know if you've ever been to Jerusalem at Easter time. I have. The um, road from Pontius Pilate's uh, courtrooms to uh, the uh, Calvary thronged with people. Thousands, thousands, I don't know how many, thousands and thousands of people and lots of them carrying crosses or whatever and they try to enact the journey that they believe Jesus Christ would have made from his trial to his crucifixion. And then I went to a early morning sunrise service at the garden tomb where we imagine what it must have been like for the women when they went to the tomb and it was empty. I lived in Nazareth and on Palm Sunday in the Baptist church I went to after the service everyone was given great big palm leaves and we had to go for a procession through Nazareth waving palm branches to remind ourselves of the uh, triumphal entry of Jesus Christ on Palm Sunday. We would enact these events to remind ourselves by acting it out of the bare bones of the story. And they did that in Old Testament days. So when they wanted to celebrate the uh, time when they went through the wilderness into the promised land, every year they would meet together and they would live in, you know, a grass huts, booths for a week. They would remember the Passover sacrifice by every fa family meeting together every year enacting the story out to remind themselves. And often when they went up to the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts, they would enact that story when David brought the ark to Jerusalem. And this psalm, we've got Psalm 132, is the one of the songs they would sing as they enacted that story. Just as we sing carols at Christmas time, this is what they would sing as they were enacting out, probably at their new year, the story of the ark being brought up to Jerusalem. It's a wonderful story. It's a very exciting story. Here's the ark of the covenant. I'm not sure whether the angels there are meant to be on top of it or whether they're meant to be at either side looking over it, but that's their uh, idea there. It was a a wooden box, it was about um, three foot six long, about two foot high, and about one foot six wide, something like that. And it was the shape of a footstool. That's what it was. It was a box that was the shape of a footstool. And it was as if um, God was sitting on his throne of glory, and his footstool was here on earth. And it was the symbol of the presence of God. But it was more than a symbol because sometimes when the people were right with God, God would dwell amongst them and his glory rested over the Ark of the Covenant. But you remember when Samuel was a little boy, the Israelites attacked the Philistines there in the beginning of 1 Samuel. And they decided to take the Ark of the Covenant into the battlefield with them. But they lost the battle and they lost the Ark. And the Philistines took the Ark and they took it to the city of Ashdod. And they put it in the temple of their god Dagon. And their great big stone statue was standing there and the Ark of the Covenant was in front of it. And when they came in the next day, the statue of Dagon had fallen on his face before the Ark. They thought this was pretty unfortunate, so they lifted the statue of Dagon up. The next day they came in and he had not only fallen, but he had smashed. So they decided they didn't want the Ark in Ashdod anymore, so they moved it to Gath, where Goliath came from. And in Gath, when the Ark was there, there seemed to be something like the bubonic plague breaking out. So they decided they didn't want the ark there, so they moved it on to Ekron. But the Ekronites didn't want it at all. So they decided they would stick it on a cart and just let it go and see if the uh, uh, oxen took it back to Israel. And that's just what happened. And the uh, 
Ark of the Covenant stayed at Kiriath-Jerim during the time of Samuel. But King Saul, well, he just forgot about it completely. He didn't bother about the Ark of the Covenant. He could just get on and do God's work, do his work without God. And then David became king. In 2 Samuel 5, finally, David became king of Israel in Jerusalem. And do you know what just about the first thing he did in 2 Samuel chapter 6 was? That's right. He said, we've got to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. We need the presence of God with us in the city. I need God with me. There's no way I can be king and keep God at the sidelines. There's no way I can be king and keep God at a distance. So David decided he would bring the ark up to Jerusalem, but he copied the style of the Philistines and he put the ark on a cart. And as it was being taken along, the cart rocked and Uzziah, who was standing behind it, put his hand out to stop, to touch the ark from falling, desecrated it, and died on the spot. Well, David didn't know what to do. He had been so excited, and now he was so confused. He was angry. He was frightened. So he left the ark in the home of a fellow called Obed-Edom. And for the next three months, there was noticeable blessing in the house of Obed-Edom. So David said, well, we've got to have that ark back in Jerusalem. So this time he went and did it properly and he got the priests to carry the ark on their pole so they weren't actually touching it. They weren't desecrating it. And they brought the ark into uh, Jerusalem. But it wasn't until David's son Solomon had built the temple and they had the great dedication of the temple and the glory of God filled the temple so that the priests couldn't work. And then in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, Solomon brought the Ark of the Covenant into the most holy place. And they had the burnt offering and the fire from heaven fell and burned up the burnt offerings. And they knew that the God who was everywhere, the God who was bigger than time and space, was a God who also met in a special place with his people in a very powerful, intense an active way. And they knew that this God, this infinite God, was meeting with them in the temple. And it was so exciting. So you can imagine these uh, pilgrims as they're marching up to Jerusalem, so excited, singing about the fact that the dwelling place of God is with men. David brought the ark to uh, Jerusalem. And when Solomon prayed, at the dedication of the temple there in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, he ended his prayer with the verses 8 and 9 from Psalm 132. Arise, O Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Well, that's the story behind the psalm, but look at the structure of the psalm, because it's so well designed. It's in two halves. And the first half, the yellow on the left, talks about David's desire to have the presence of God with him in Jerusalem. And so it begins, O Lord, remember David and all the hardships he endured in bringing the ark up to Jerusalem. And then it begins, verse 2, he swore an oath to the Lord, and we're told what his oath was. And then the last half of the first section, verses 6 to 9, is uh, the people's response, where they pray at the end, may your priests be clothed with righteousness, may your saints sing for joy. And then verses 10 to 16, not 10 to 18, but 10 to 16, balance this out perfectly. There's the introduction, verse 10, for the sake of David your servant. And then verse 11, instead of David swearing an oath to the Lord, we have the Lord swore an oath to David. And verse 16 ends with God giving more than was asked for in verse 9. It says in verse 9, may your priests be clothed with righteousness. In verse 16, God says, I will clothe the priests with salvation, more than personal righteousness. Now it's salvation to those around them, reached with the word of God. And may your saints sing for joy. 
And it says here, and her saints will ever sing for joy. You see how the Lord gives more than is asked for. So you see the structure of this psalm. The first half is David wanting the presence of God with him. And the second half, you can hear David's successors saying, for the sake of David, your servant, do not reject us. Do not reject your anointed king today. Lord, be with us today. So that's the structure of the psalm. Let's go through it quite quickly. We'll spend more time with the first half. And we look, first of all, at verses 1 to 9, which is the desire for God's presence. The story is told of Daniel Rowland. Daniel Rowland was probably the greatest Welsh preacher uh, at the time when Wesley and Whitfield were going around. Um, Daniel Rowland was there in Wales, and he was a very powerful preacher. And one day he didn't turn up for the church service, so they'd all met like this in the church service, and the preacher didn't come to preach. So they were a bit worried, and so they thought, well, maybe he's forgotten the time, maybe he's fallen asleep. So they sent a girl to, to run down to his house and tell him that everybody was ready. And she came back without him. They said, well, didn't you tell him to come? No, she said. Why not? Well, he was talking to someone. And he was saying to that person, I will not go unless you come with me. Ah, they said, he's praying. We'll wait for him. Because he knew that he wasn't to go into the pulpit and preach the word of God unless he knew that God was with him. Moses knew the same experience. Moses was called to lead the children of Israel out of the uh, slavery in Egypt into the promised land. And what did Moses say to God? Do not send me up from here unless your presence comes with me. I don't want to do it on my own. And if you read the short letter of James in the New Testament, he, he teaches us the same thing. He tells us to come near to God so that God will come near to us and we will have that communion with God. And Paul says the same thing. He tells us to keep ourselves in the love of God. We can walk away, but we must, we must keep ourselves in the love of God. And the Apostle John says the same thing. He tells us to walk in the light as God is in the light. We're to have this communion with God, this sense of God's presence with us. And so we see, first of all here in verses uh, 2 to 5, the priority of knowing God's presence. If you look at verse 3, David says, I will not enter my house or go to my bed till I find a place for the Lord. He says, the Lord's out there down in Kiriath Jerim, and he should be here with me in the capital city. And it's more important than me going home and having tea. It's more important than me going to bed. Indeed, in verse 4, he says, I will allow no sleep to my eyes, no slumber to my eyelids. I won't even take a nap till I find a place for the Lord. We need God with us. We need to be in the presence of God. God must be near. Too long. The presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, was just pushed to the sidelines for the whole life of Saul. They didn't bother about God, just kept him in the sidelines. And we can do that, can't we? We can just push God to the perimeter of our lives. John Bunyan not only wrote Pilgrim's Progress, but he also wrote a book called Mansoul. And in Mansoul, it's the story of the battle for the soul of a man. And this man, he has God in him. But he just ignores God. He neglects such a great salvation. And so the Lord just withdraws. And when the battle with the powers of hell comes, suddenly the man finds he's on his own. He's lost the presence of God. and He's in a desperate situation. Remember Simon Peter. On the night that the Lord was betrayed, he followed the Lord at a distance, afar off. And when the temptations came, he crumbled. You look at your life. We're so busy with our jobs. And we're so busy with our families. And we're so busy with our church commitments. 
And we find that there's so little time to actually be serious about the things of God and to draw near to God so that God comes near to us. And so it's as if we just leave the ark at a distance and we keep God at the edges, at the perimeter of our life. Oh, he's there in case we need him, we think. But actually he's there and we're just getting on, doing our life and doing the things of God sometimes in our own strength. We need to, as David did, bring the ark close to him. And we need to make sure that we bring God into the very center of our lives. We need to begin the day with God, spend the day with God, end the day with God. For us to live must be Christ. We must walk in the Spirit. We must know the presence of God. The priority of God's presence, God must be there, and we need God's presence now. Notice David's determination here. I'm going to sort this out today. I can't put this off till tomorrow or next week or next year. And yet there are many people in the Christian church today who don't want to sort this out. Because there's sin in their lives that they want to hold on to. And they know that if they're going to bring, as it were, God into the center of their lives, then this sin has to go. And we need to determine today that we will repent of this sin. We will turn our back upon this sin. And we will come and we will kneel before our God and say, Lord, be the center. Reign over me. Be with me. I don't want you at a distance. I don't want a half-hearted Christianity. I don't want to be lukewarm. We need to repent of our sin. But some of us, and here's our problem. Our problem is we do want to be out and out for Jesus Christ. We do want, as it were, the Ark of the Covenant right with us. We do want God to fill our lives, to be with us. But we think, if this one thing in my life was sorted out, then I could walk with God. But there's just this one thing in my life that I need God to sort out before I can walk close with him. Maybe, well, it's just problems at work. And I really, I really cannot be close to God because of this problem at work. Or maybe it's a problem at home. Or maybe it's that I'm single. Or maybe it's that I... I don't have the finances I need. And there's this big problem, and it eats me up, and I'm always praying, Lord, Lord, deal with this, and then I'll be walking close with you. And what we don't realize is the Lord leaves that problem in our lives deliberately. He wants there to be that problem in our life because he doesn't want us to walk close with him because we've got what we want. He wants our desire to walk close with him, to be greater than our desire for other things. Do you understand it? So he leaves there this area in our life so that we can say, well, there is that problem, but I desire God more. Christ comes first. I'm not going to let anything stop me walking with God. And so I'm going to repent of putting other things first. And I'm going to bring the ark, as it were, into Jerusalem. And to know the presence of God with me. Elizabeth Elliot wrote a book. I think it was called Burned Ashes or something like that. Or Ashes. Because she said that in her young life there were three things in her life. And she said that to the Lord, I cannot really do what you want me to do with my life until you sort these things out. And God didn't sort these things out. And she said she had to take them and put them on the altar where the fire of God fell and burned them up, and they were just reduced to ashes. But looking back, she's so glad that the Lord didn't do what she wanted. And we have to do that. There's that in our life which wants to come first and wants to keep God second. We'll give God first place when he sorts this out for us. And we've got to say no. Let that be burnt on the altar. Jesus Christ comes first. I must know his presence. There must be no barrier between me and God. I mustn't leave the ark at Kiriath Jerim, or Jar, as it's called in verse 6. It's got to be brought close to me. And then we see there in verses 2 to 5, that was the priority of God's presence. As we move on to verses 6 to 9, we see the blessings that flow from God's presence. And they said, we heard it in 
Ephrata. Not that they heard of the ark in Ephrata. The ark is masculine. The word here, it, is feminine. What they heard was the noise of the people singing and shouting as they were bringing the ark up to Jerusalem. And they came upon it in the fields of Jar. And what were the people singing? Verse 7, they were singing... Let us draw near to God. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Let us draw near to God. And then, verse 8, Arise, O Lord, and come to us. Come to your resting place. You and the ark of your might. We draw near to God, and God comes near to us. Do you know how you draw near to God? It's through prayer. As we come to the throne of grace. It's in praise as we sing his praises. So we come to him by the blood of Jesus Christ in prayer. And how does God come near to us? Through his word. As we meditate upon his word until our hearts throb with the sense that, yes, God is speaking to me. God is dealing with me. I'm in the presence of God. And at services like this, where we hear God speaking to us, we come near to God, he he comes near to us. And the result is, verse 9, righteousness and rejoicing. May your priests be clothed with righteousness, and may your saints sing for joy. But here's the question. How do we know if we're in the presence of God? How do we know if we've come near to God? Well, normally, it is impossible to be in the presence of God and not feel anything, right? Religion's more than notion. Something must be known and felt. We experience God. But what does it feel like to experience God? I mean, I can feel this pulpit. I know what it feels like. I... I can feel the heat and the cold. I know what it feels like. I can feel anger. I know what it feels like. But what does it feel like to feel God? We talk lots about people saying, oh, I felt the presence of God in church today. Maybe they said that to you. Maybe you said it to them. But what does God feel like? How do we know what God feels like? What's the answer? And the answer is that when we're in the presence of God, we feel something. But what we feel is our emotions being moved. All right? So what we feel is not we're touching God. We're feeling emotion. Sometimes we feel incredible guilt. Woe unto me, I'm a man of unclean lips because I'm in the presence of God. Sometimes we we feel a sense of awe. Go away from me, Lord. I'm not fit in your presence. Sometimes we feel joy and we're going to explode with joy. We, we, We can feel different things. And here's the danger. We can feel these same things without being in the presence of God. So we can have doleful music and I can tell sad stories and we can feel incredibly guilty. Or we can sing lively songs and I can tell jokes and we can feel really happy. Or we can use the PA system and it can echo through and there's that sense of awe. That's why they used to build churches with high steeples and stained glass windows to create this feeling of awe. And and you can come to church or you can be at home and you can feel fear and awe. You can feel guilt and sorrow. You can feel joy. But that does not necessarily mean you're in the presence of God. If you are in the presence of God, you will feel these things. But you can feel these things without being in the presence of God. So how do we know we've been in the presence of God? Because it has two consequences. Verse 9. First of all, righteousness. When we walk in the presence of God, we must walk in holiness of life. You cannot be near to God and be keeping sin in your heart. Do you understand that? So how do you know that you're walking with God? It's because you are walking in holiness of life. There is righteousness. And the second consequence of being in the presence of God is your life becomes characterized by joy. There is rejoicing. There is righteousness and rejoicing, or purity and praise, or salvation and singing. But there are these two consequences that impact our lives. So that, well, we've walked with God and it's changing our lives. How do I know I've been with God? Not because I felt something, although I did feel something, but because it's changing my life from the inside out. That I hate sin and I rejoice in the gospel. 
Dr. H. H. Farmer was a well-known preacher who was speaking at a Salvation Army rally. And he had very delicate tastes in music. And they placed him on the stage next to the big brass band, right next to a young guy with the big drums who was beating them for all his worth. And Dr. Farmer was getting a bit <sighs> tense by all this, so he said to the boy, he said, do you think you could um, play the drums a little bit more quietly, please? Lord bless you, sir, said the Salvation Army drummer. He says, since I've been converted, I've been so happy, I think I can burst the blooming drums. <laughs> and Dr. Farmer realized that maybe he shouldn't try to squash people's joy. It's a natural result of being right with God, of being close with God of being in the presence of God, of keeping yourself in the love of God, of walking in the Spirit, of bringing the ark from a distance close, that we now walk in holiness of life and we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. The desire for God's presence. The second half of the psalm, which we can deal with much, much more quickly, verses 10 to 18 tell us the desire for God's continued presence. So these people singing, walking up to Jerusalem, say, Lord, you were with David. You blessed David. Now, Lord, bless us. And the blessing is threefold. It's a blessing of a permanent king. Here in verse 12, if your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach them, then their sons will sit on your throne forever and ever. There's the blessings of a permanent king. Then verses 13 to 16 go on to tell us the blessings of the covenant. Um, there in verse 15, I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor I will satisfy with food. I will clothe the priest with salvation. Her saints will ever sing for joy. These are the, the blessings of the covenant that God had promised. But here's the question. Who sits on the throne in Jerusalem? Back in verses 11 and 12, it was the promise that one of David's sons would sit on the throne, wasn't it? But what do we read here in verse 14? God says, this is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. So who sits on the throne in Jerusalem? Let me put it this way. Is it the son of David who sits on the throne, or is it the God of David who sits on the throne? And they had to live with this tension down through the centuries until finally Mary gave birth to her son, her firstborn child, and laid him in a manger. And he was the son of David and the God of David. He was the king of the Jews. He had come finally, and this was fulfilled. And Jesus Christ reigns forever. The psalm is being fulfilled that God has installed his son as king in Zion for all eternity, and one day we shall stand before his throne and worship him. Indeed, I like to think of the ark. This is probably stretching things very, very far. You'll have to forgive me, but it's just a picture I have in my mind. I see the ark of the covenant there as this gold box, and at either side of it, I see an angel standing. And then I see the empty tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and I see that stone slab. And at either end, I see an angel standing. This is the dwelling place of God, where God meets with his people in Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for us. He is the king. This is where we meet with God. He's the one we praise. He's the one we know. And the psalm should end here at verse 16, because it balances out with verse 9. The prayer was do this and verse 16 says God says I will do it but the psalm doesn't end there it's as if God can't stop blessing his people so we go on thirdly in verses 17 and 18 to see that we grow spiritually in God's presence I've got three little pictures first of all here will I make a horn grow for David what is a horn well it's a picture of power of strength so think of the horns of a bull and God says, when you live in my presence, when I'm with you, then you're going to be strong. Temptations lose their power when I'm near. You're strong. Your service will be strong. You'll be able to endure. You'll be able to be committed. Indeed, when opposition and persecution comes, 
you will be strong. For my horn grows. Not only that, but the light shines. Set up a lamp for my anointed one. The light of the glory of God shines in the face of Jesus Christ. And we see clearly. This world makes sense. We know eternity is to come. We know the Bible is true. We know Jesus is the Son of God. The light shines. Not only are we given strength, but we're given understanding. And then there is the crown. Verse 18 says, I will clothe his enemies with shame, like those people at Gath and uh, Ashdod. But the crown on his head shall be resplendent. Jesus Christ will reign over everything, over us, over our ambitions, over our money, our talents, our time, over everything. He is king. When we live in his presence, like this psalm, we see, well, really, everything is about Jesus Christ. And everything about us is for Jesus Christ. You know the story of um, Brother Lawrence, who worked in the... Um, kitchens at the Carmelite monastery. Being a soldier, big guy came, Carmelite monk, and he ended up, he would break everything. And he wasn't very popular, and so they made him work in the kitchens, and he didn't like it. But he determined that he was going to practice the presence of God there in the kitchen. And he found, he got to the point where whenever he even picked up the dirt off the floor, he knew he was doing it for the Lord. He was in his presence. It changed his life. As the Olympics come to the end, we Remember Eric Little, 1924, was it, when he won the 400 meters, or was it 440 yards in those days? And then he went off as a missionary to China, and he ended his days dying in a Japanese prison of war camp. And yet they say every morning, before people had to get up, an hour before, he would get up, he would take his little oil lamp, he would go down to a little uh, shed in the camp, and he would get out his Bible, and he would spend an hour in God's presence, Praying, drawing near to God, reading the word so God came near to him. And it changed his life so he could live for the glory of God in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. And what about you and me? Are we keeping God at a distance? Or are we going to say, Jesus, reign in my life. Be near me, Lord Jesus. Jesus, be the center of my life. David made a vow. He promised he was going to sort this out that day. And God made a vow that he would bless David's descendants. We've made a promise. We're going to sing about it now. Oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. We'll